This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by Hi.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hi.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Kuchu. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with uh, Joey Krug. Joey Krug is the co-founder of Augur. Many of you have probably heard of Augur. Augur is a prediction market that raised about 5 million US dollars in a crowd sale uh, quite a while ago. And, and he was previously he was a computer science student at uh, Pomona College and has been very young, but diving fully into, into the crypto world and into the world of prediction markets. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on, Joey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so this is a topic that we somehow don't seem to be able to get away from. So we've done, I don't know how many episodes already on prediction market. This is certainly the fifth or sixth episode or even more that we've done here, probably even more. And uh, Augur, I think, is probably the best known project um, in, in the cryptocurrency space, the best known uh, prediction market project, uh, maybe along with Gnosis now, Augur is probably still a uh, bit better known. And yeah, they, they did a big crowd sale uh, quite a while ago, which got a lot of attention. And, and now it's still sort of, you know, they're building it and, and a lot of people are waiting to, to see the launch. So look forward to, to diving into this today. So uh, maybe to get started, Joey, can you tell us a little bit about how did Augur come about? Like what, what's the origin story? Yeah, so, so like the, the idea for Augur is kind of, it's really kind of a combination of like three, three different ideas proposed by other people. Um, we just kind of combined them in, a, in an interesting way. So there was a paper in, in 2014 called Decentralizing Prediction Markets in Limit Order Books. Um, and that was a paper written by some guys at Princeton. And it was basically the idea to make a decentralized prediction market. And so like our order book mechanism, the mechanism for issuing shares, things like that, all came from there. Um, and then there was a blog post by Vitalik called Shelling Coin, which was this idea for getting real world information uh, into the blockchain using a, basically a set of mechanism. Um, and the idea is that you'd like put up a bond with Ether, and if, if you were, were wrong, you'd lose the bond. Um, so we use that. And then the third thing we, were, we use is there's this project called Truthcoin, which proposed using a um, similar system to what Shellingcoin did, except instead of using something like Ether as the bond, you'd uh, create a new token that was directly tied to the prediction market, which makes it easier to reason about the security and also kind of prevents like you know, if you use Ether, maybe 2% of people, Ether would participate. If a whale comes in, they can mess up the entire system. But if you have a token where, you know, everyone's participating, and if they're not, they're losing it, then it's a bit easier to reason about the security. So we basically combined those three things to kind of create Augur. Um, we started working on it in, in 2014, um, and we were initially building on Bitcoin Core and ended up switching to Ethereum. And what made you excited about this idea of prediction market and particularly decentralized prediction markets? Um, so the most interesting thing to me is really that it kind of allows for the first time a, a few things. It allows for there to be a global kind of financial market where anyone can go to it, you know, without capital controls. Um, a person in China can participate on it, someone in the U.S. can. Uh, today, that's not really the case for most financial markets. Um, it's also relative to certain things. It can be cheaper. Um, and then... Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting to me is just the idea of using prediction markets to actually like predict things. Um, you know, currently today we don't have very good information about the future. And what we do have is mostly from people like pundits who, you know, are kind of like broken clocks. They're right, you know, a couple times a day and that's about it. Um, and so with prediction markets, we can aim to get better information about the future. Yeah, and of course we have, yeah, we have plenty of episodes that explore this, this topic in depth and we can, we can get back into that a little bit as well. And, and of course, we will have links to that. So you mentioned that originally Augur was based on Bitcoin and yet it was to, to build it as a Bitcoin sidechain. What happened there? Why did you end up switching to Ethereum? 
Yeah, so originally the idea was like to add some opcodes to Bitcoin, actually quite a few opcodes. Um, and then once sidechains came out, we'd make a two-way peg between Bitcoin and you know our sidechain of Bitcoin. Um, the way we kind of got building on Ethereum was I'd, I'd been working on it on Bitcoin about a month and I'd added a few opcodes uh, for like trading stuff basically. Um, and one weekend I was sitting around and I was like, I thought about using Ethereum. I was like, maybe I should just check it out and see what it's like. So I decided to try to build what I'd built, you know, over the past month on Ethereum. Um, and I was able to do it in, in one day, the same, same work that I'd spent, you know, 30 days on, on Bitcoin. Um, so then that kind of made me think, well, if we're making all these modifications to Bitcoin, are we really getting a whole lot of Bitcoin security model by doing that? And the answer I kind of concluded was no, not really. Um, and it, it made more sense for us to just kind of uh, take the gamble with Ethereum um, as opposed to building on Bitcoin. And the, the, the ability to make stuff a lot faster on, on Ethereum is, is also pretty useful. Because with Bitcoin, you have these really low-level opcodes. Uh, and on Ethereum, you have you know, relatively high-level programming languages that you can build applications with. Um, of course, like if you compare Bitcoin to Ethereum, you, you know, Ethereum would be the logical uh, the logical blockchain on which you would build something like this because you have that much more more flexibility. Um, do you do 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 you think that uh, something like Augur could potentially live and become successful on a side chain, or have you given up that idea completely? So I mean, like like it could, uh, but I I've basically kind of ditched that idea. Um, you know, I think I think what would be most interesting if, is if there were a good side chain between Ethereum and Bitcoin. So there's like BTC relay right now. Um, it'd be great if there were like a two-way peg side chain. Um, the only kind of problem with that is the the people at Blockstream aren't really willing to uh, add support for verification of SHA three proofs to Bitcoin, which is a problem since Ethereum uses SHA three. Um, so you'd probably have to have some like intermediary side chain, which would get kind of complicated. So let's dive into prediction markets. Uh, as Brian mentioned, this is a topic that we've covered extensively on the show, so we're not going to go in too deep into prediction markets, but uh, I, I'd like to just reiterate some of the, uh, for, for you to, to give us your perspective on some, what are some of the best use cases uh, for prediction markets today. Again, I think the most, most useful use case, for, you know, like today, like if Augur were live right now, I think would be... Um, allowing people to trade things that they normally, you know, wouldn't be able to trade for whatever reason. So um, my favorite example is, you know, if you're a Chinese national and you want to buy something like Apple, but you can't uh, because there's too many capital controls. If you're a huge whale and you have, you know, big institutional connections, you can do it. Uh, but as an average Chinese middle class citizen, you're kind of stuck with the current Chinese markets, which most of the stocks aren't that good. And you also have lots of problems with people like average Chinese middle class citizens are trading commodities at 20 to 1 leverage because they want to speculate on stuff, but they can't. Um, and so the stuff they're speculating on is just kind of crazy. And so I think if you use prediction markets on something like Ethereum, you can actually get the same profit and loss of something like Apple. Of course, you don't have any dividends, um, but it allows people to trade things that they never were able to trade before, which I think is, is pretty useful. And you, you, it's interesting how you use this, this word speculation, and especially with you know, sort of the Chinese market. Uh, there's this interesting sort of... Uh, um, thing that happens with prediction markets, where some of the people that talk about it definitely look at it as 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 a speculative tool and something that you could use for essentially gambling, and others would look at it as something that can be very useful for society. Uh, you know, I would uh, uh, I would encourage our listeners to go back to the Robert uh, the Ralph Merkel uh, interview. Um, what is your position on that? Where you stand with regards to prediction markets? And, and they are sort of usefulness for society, or do you see them more as really a speculative tool? Um, so I, I would say, I mean, I see them as both. I think, I think speculative tools are inherently useful for society. Um, you know, of course, like Occupy Wall Street people would disagree with me, but um, there's a great paper by the economist Frederick Hayek. It's called The Use of Knowledge in Society. And it's basically about how speculative markets or financial markets have prices, and prices are equivalent to information. So... Better prices means better information in society. So I think that you know they're, they're kind of intertwined. You can't really separate them from each other. So um, by the virtue of having better financial markets, you have better prices. So you have better information that society can use to make decisions. So I kind of view it as like 
if you want to make better decisions, there's a couple ways to do it. I mean, one is to just, you know, ask an expert and hopefully they'll give you a good answer. The other is to use something like a prediction market and try to make the market as, you know, liquid and, and healthy as possible to give you the best answer that you can get. And so I think the speculation kind of ties in very nicely there. You know, you can't have prediction markets without speculation and you can't really have the information without it either. They're, they're both, it's like a yin and yang, you need both of them. So there, there's been a lot of um, kind of repression of prediction markets, right? They're, they're, the concept's been around for a long time. At the same time, they're not really used very much, although, of course, you can think of some of the existing markets as prediction markets, but kind of like pure prediction markets are uh, a very marginalized thing. The, the biggest one in trade was shut down or, or forced to shut down. Why do you think there is so much... Uh, so much difficulty around uh, creating and operating prediction markets when at the same time, a lot of financial markets are, you know, government supported, regulated, et cetera. Right. So I think if you look at the history of financial markets, they, they've always kind of been like this. Um, like the stock market was initially considered just gambling and it was basically something that, you know, shouldn't exist and governments didn't like the idea of having stock markets. Um, and you see the same thing for almost every other type of financial market in history. Um, same thing for options markets, same things for futures. And so it, it's kind of natural that prediction markets as a sort of different category of financial market would follow the same progression where they're kind of ignored and people don't really get them or they kind of don't think it's a good idea at first. Uh, so it, it makes sense to me that, that we've kind of, you know, that that's happening. Um, it's, it's, I think it's just like a natural thing that eventually... Um, they'll become, you know, a, a more widely recognized type of financial market that people will participate in. Um, you know, like a good example is if you're a global macro investor and you want to make, you know, a, a trade on something where you have some macro information, a prediction market's almost always, given that it has liquidity, a way better way to do that than in an existing financial market because you cannot get the exact contract that you want. Um, whereas with the prediction market, you can have a contract on anything, any future event. Um, so I think eventually they'll kind of be recognized as normal financial markets, but it just takes time. So, so you think this is really because prediction markets are fairly young and because they're not too well understood, but once that changes, they will be accepted. There's nothing deeper that's creating a bit of aversion and resistance to prediction markets. So I agree with that for the most part. Um, there is, I mean, there's one kind of small bit of aversion that you can have with prediction markets, which is that since they're a very broad financial tool. They're basically a financial market where it says you can make a financial market on any future event. And that's kind of what a prediction market is. Since they're so broad, uh, you can use them for things that are like kind of, you know, things that people wouldn't want to speculate on, which makes people kind of wary of them. Um, so if you look at like the um, future, future map project uh, in the mid 2000s, which is a project like with the CIA and DARPA, they were going to have prediction markets on predicting basically geopolitical events like terrorist attacks or, you know, whether a certain dictator would be disposed, things like that. And so there is a version for those reasons. But on, like, the financial side, like, you know, predicting um, some economic data, like, say, GDP or something directly, I don't, I don't think there's much aversion there. Now, prediction markets have been shown to work pretty well for, you know, big popular culture uh, phenomenons, like they're very much used in you know, political, uh, to make political predict predictions, sporting. Uh, also, the, I was sort of surprised to learn that there's a lot of prediction markets around Hollywood movies and which ones are going to gross the most, etc. cetera. Uh, so, you know, these categories seem to, um, seem to work very well with prediction markets. Do you see other categories in which they're successful or other categories which may emerge in the future? Uh, where prediction markets could be uh, a good tool to predict outcomes. Yeah, I think and I think one of the most interesting you know things you can predict with them is like um, data surrounding companies. Um, so like you know how many sales a certain product will do, um, whether Apple's going to release X or Y first, things like that would be very interesting um, as opposed to just hearing them from like the rumor mill. Um, so things like that. I and mean, there's also the really wild out ones, you know, like Robin Hanson talks about where you have like a market on like, should we fire the CEO of X publicly traded company? And what would the stock price do if we did that? Um, I think somebody will probably make a market like that on Augur. I think it'd be very interesting. Um, Microsoft in the mid 2000s um, 
could have avoided, you know, a long, slow decline if they had had a market like that, I think. Because um, after the last CEO left and then, you know, Satya Nadella or whatever, whatever his name is, um, became CEO, the stock price jumped uh, quite a bit. and They've been doing pretty well since then. So if you had markets like the kind of, you know, um, catch stuff like that early, I think it'd be, I think it'd be a good thing for, for society. I was, I was watching, uh, the, there was a, a panel at DEF CON, uh, with, I believe your co-founder, uh, on prediction markets and the moderator gave this example of, uh, how could you, uh, uh, establish a prediction market to find out whether or not Walmart was doing well as, as a publicly traded company. And one way you could do that is, uh, have local prediction markets on how well the stores are doing or um, if the construction of new stores uh, is going on schedule and then to this sort of micro economic uh, indicator at a very local level would allow you to establish predictions at a more macro level on you know how is this company doing yeah I like, I like that idea of using it like one thing that they're also really good for is like predicting deadlines for things um, Prediction markets are pretty accurate. Like on that, like like just recently, I, I uh, started a prediction market internally in Augur for a deadline for um, like the next version of the beta. Um, so, so stuff like that is kind of cool because you can see um, what people actually think. You know, from like a a level where they're they're willing to lose money if they're wrong, which is a lot different than what you get if you just ask someone a question. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a cryptocurrency wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now there are two cryptocurrencies that matter at the moment. One is Bitcoin and one is Ether. But using them can be tricky. What wallet to use? How do you secure them? Where did I leave my umbrella? It's all a big mess. And that's where JAX comes in. JAX is a unified wallet. It works across all your devices. It works for the Android phone, Apple iPhone. It works for your desktop computer. And they have browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And it works for both currencies at the same time. It works for Bitcoin and it works for Ether. What are the things that makes JAX as delightful as walking through the 5th arrondissement of Paris on a Sunday morning and getting a whiff of fresh pastries is uh, how they leverage HD wallets. So they use a 12 word single backup seed for all three currencies and make it super easy to sync your wallets across all your devices. So if you're using the Chrome extension or the desktop app, you just can whip out your phone, scan the QR code and boom, your wallets are synced. And plus uh, the people at Jax take your security very seriously. It's open source so anybody can look at the code and plus they never hold any customer funds. All the keys are stored locally. Uh, on the client side. So go to jax.io, that's J A X X.io, download the Jax wallet right now and understand what it's like to use a next generation wallet. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. You mentioned that prediction markets are, well, good or have a good track record. Now, one of the things you said uh, or that was written on the website is that prediction markets kind of leverage the, this idea of the wisdom of the crowds. Now, I was just kind of reading a little bit about that book. And in that book, uh, he says that one of the uh, assumptions to have this wisdom of the crowd's effect is that you have independence. So, uh, you know, different people make predictions. And let's say now if we talk about GDP, right, uh, I'm going to say, okay, GDP next year in the U.S. is going to be grow by 1%. And, and then sort of all of those are taken together. And then you take the average, you have this kind of wisdom of the crowd's effect. But when you don't have independence, of course, is when I see what everybody else is doing, like you have in kind of regular markets. So what is your thought on that? How do you think about independence and, and its effect on, on the usefulness and accuracy of prediction markets? Yeah, so um, you know, the, the wisdom of the crowd, like if you, if you read that book, I think it's by James Surawaki. Um, it, it talks about, like, most of the markets, mar sorry, not markets, most of the examples they use um, are not actually, like, financial markets. So I think that independence matters a lot more in, in things that aren't financial markets because you don't have money on the line. Um, so when you have money on the line, your thinking becomes a, bit, becomes a bit clearer because, you know, you're going to lose money if you, if you make the wrong decision. Um, and he does touch on, like, financial markets. He talks about how, um, I, I don't remember if it was Challenger or... or um, or which NASA messed up with the O-rings, but the stock market basically 
pointed out which company made the O-rings based off of a huge decline in their stock a few days after the crash. Um, so I think, I think it works in financial markets too. It's just that independence is a bit different because you, have, you don't really have as much independence. You just have a price and people are saying whether they think the price is wrong or not. Um, the nice thing about financial markets is though, or, or any market in general, is everyone thinks they know more than everyone else. Um, or at least the most, most participants do, which is why you see like, you know, the vast majority of hedge funds lose, lose money compared to just buying the S&P. Um, and so I think that, that that kind of counteracts the, the drawbacks of, of having lack of independence, the real money factor, basically. Yeah, no, that I think that's a that's a valid point, and and, and I guess prediction markets are going to be as efficient in that regard as other financial markets, right? So of course, they will not be perfect, and there will be uh, strange phenomena, but that's that's just the same thing we have with uh, stock market prices or exchange rates and stuff. So moving on to to go a little bit more in depth with Augur. What does Augur's architecture look like? What are the different components in there? Yeah, so there's really kind of like three main roles in Augur. Uh, so there's the market creation side of things, which is, you know, um, traditionally for prediction markets, you're just kind of stuck with whatever markets the place you're going has. And so you can't create another one if you want to. Uh, with Augur, anyone can kind of create their own prediction market contract in a few minutes uh, on Ethereum. And so um, there's that role. There's also the trader role, which is you know the person who obviously is buying and selling shares on, on in the markets, and then the third role is the reporting role, which is used to kind of resolve the markets in Augur. So, uh, if I understand correctly, the the first thing that you said is that anybody can create predictions. So, what you're saying is that with with Augur, anybody can create their own predictions uh, independent of you know the community's will or some central authority's uh, desire to host those predictions is. Is that sort of the general uh, value proposition or something like this? Right. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about reporting. Uh, this is an interesting sort of concept where in a typical prediction market, uh, you would have some sort of a, of a central authority or a central body that would be bringing in uh, data feeds uh, and, um, and reporting on the outcome of a prediction uh, or an event. Um, how does that occur in Augur? How does Augur get its data uh, on, uh, on the outcome of an event? Right. So the way Augur kind of does it is it has this reporting process where this basically, you know, basically we sold this thing called reputation in the crowd sale, which is a very crypto economic reputation. It's basically saying that I'm willing to you know, have this thing that's worth value and I'm willing to lose it if I report inaccurately or dishonestly. And so the reporting process kind of has three different phases to it um, and everything goes well, you only get to the first, you only do the first one. And the way it works is initially people are randomly selected to report on events. So there may be a market about um, a presidential election, there may be one about the share price of Apple, and you get selected to report on one of those, I get selected to report on the other, something like that. You submit your report um, and then what happens is it basically takes basically a simple average of our reports um, and then someone can kind of challenge it if they think it's wrong. And to do this, they post a bond or they put money up and then everyone reports on it. And at that point, if their answer is the same thing we agreed on, the person loses the bond because they basically just wasted the system's time. Um, if it's different, then uh, they actually get money back because they you know, challenged the system and, and were actually right. Because then the final part of reporting is you can also actually fork the network if this, this phase where everyone reported on everything ended up getting it wrong as well. And so the, the way reporting works is kind of every two months you're selected to report on a random subset of events. And the idea here, so with reputation, which is the thing that you sold uh, during the crowd sale, uh, then the expectation too is now if I hold some of this reputation tokens, it gives me two things. One is kind of, it gives me like a job, right? So I have to report on events. And then the other thing is it gives me some kind of a chance for a return, which could be through either the appreciation of the token, right? It, it gains in value, it's tradable, or through, through some fees that get paid to me. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So the way the fees work is 
um, when someone creates a market, uh, half the fees go to the reporters. Um, the other half are split up amongst the person who created the market and people who are market making on the, on the market or providing liquidity. I'm curious here. Why did you call this reputation? Because reputation, as I looked up the definition before, and it said uh, reputation is the beliefs and opinions that are held about someone. Right? So when we think about reputation in our life, then you know, it's, I, I, this person has a reputation to be reliable, to be a fraudster, something like that. Uh, and that's very much kind of attached to that person and their actions. Now, you're making this reputation tradable, which seems to be completely contrary to how we commonly understand reputation. So how does that make sense? So we, we thought about tons of different names, and this is kind of the one we, we stuck on. I, I kind of thought it was kind of a bad name for those reasons as well, but we couldn't think of a better one. Um, it's, a very, it's a very crypto economic reputation. So yeah, if you think about reputation, you traditionally think of something like, Oh, that guy's a reputable person. You know, he'll pay you money back if you load him fifty dollars. Or that person has you know two hundred something stars on eBay. It's probably fine to buy from them. Or this person has a four and a half star rating on Amazon. They seem like a good seller. Um, with Augur, though, yeah, it's it's quite a bit different. It's a very it's a very economic reputation. It's basically saying that because because in, in crypto systems, at least as of you know twenty sixteen, there's not a real good way to kind of have that sort of um, ephemeral reputation that you have with Amazon or the fact that you just know someone. Um, and so basically due to like things like symbol attacks and due to the fact that people are pseudonymous. Um, and so to get something that's kind of more secure, you really need an economic one where it's basically saying, I'm reputable and the way I'm going to prove to you that I'm reputable is that I'm willing to lose a bunch of money if I try to screw you over. It's, it's kind of what it is. Um, it's, that's, that's kind of the way it, the way it works. Okay, very interesting. So does that mean, let's say now the situation had been different and there were good uh, reputation systems, decentralized blockchain-based reputation system when you guys started Augur, do you think that would have been better to rely on, on a more sort of real sense of reputation the way we know it from, from life versus this tradable um, reputation that you currently have? That's an interesting question. Um, I think, I mean, so from a purely economics game theory perspective, uh, the answer would be no, because you want it to be such that if someone, you want someone to have no incentive to do, to do something wrong. So you want them to like lose so much money that any money they, they can make from doing something wrong um, is far less than what they would actually lose from just doing the wrong behavior. Um, so from an economic standpoint, the answer is no. From a more practical standpoint, I mean, yeah, if you had something that were like, like you could have like, you know, some way to prove that someone was like 100% perfectly reputable, then um, yeah, it'd probably be simpler. Um, but I don't think, I don't think, I don't think you can even do that in real life, you know. Um, there, there's no way to prove that someone's like always reputable and, and never going to make a bad decision. Um, like if you look at even Ntrade, Ntrade resolved a few markets wrong. Um, and they're like the most popular prediction market that's, that's existed so far. Um, so I think the... You know, the, the economist in, in, in me would, would say that I like the incentive mechanisms better of, of having an economic reputation as opposed to a uh, more feel-good style one. So let's come back on how this mechanism works exactly. So uh, as, as uh, uh, predictions come to term, you have these reputation, the people that hold reputation tokens uh, make, um, will, will vote on the outcome of that prediction. And one, one point that Brian made earlier uh, when we were talking about this, which I thought was interesting, is that as this, as you know, Augur becomes uh, larger, uh, this may become hard to scale. And so you uh, may see, start seeing similar things that happened in Bitcoin, for instance, which is, you know, uh, the pooling of uh, miners. Well, you, perhaps you would see sort of pooling of those uh, uh, reputation tokens into one central uh, authority, may, which which would be able to uh, take in perhaps data feeds uh, externally and uh, and sort of manage the uh, uh, voting on those predictions in a lot in a much more efficient way. Um, do you is this something? How, how do you how do you plan on keeping it so that it's so that the reputation tokens 
holders and the voting on the outcome of predictions stays decentralized when, you know, I guess the desired outcome is that Augur becomes some huge uh, uh, prediction market. Right. So uh, the one thing that really helps with that is, is the randomized reporting. So the fact that you're only having to report on a subset of events. Um, I mean, I've played around with the math a bit. You can get to a, a few hundred thousand events a year. And as an average reporter, even as someone with a good amount of rep like me, um, you're not going to have like to work quite a, a whole lot. Like I think with, with the amount of rep I have, I'd have to work maybe a few hours every two months reporting on Augur if there were a couple hundred thousand events a year. Um, now, if it scales even farther than that, so there's two things. Like with a couple hundred thousand events, you can get the vast majority of, of volume on on the vast majority of things people want to speculate in the world today. Um, if you look at like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, they only have maybe 40 or 50 things you can trade on. Um, the total amount of stocks in the U.S. is, I think, if, if you count like the main publicly traded exchanges, I think it's it's maybe like around 10, 15,000. Um, and so, so you can get quite far with, with a not large amount of events. If it's scale even farther beyond that, so people start using Augur for really micro things, um, like the Walmart examples, then um, yeah, it does become more concerned about, about uh, like pooling and things like that. The nice thing about Augur is though, since it's a very economic reputation, um, the incentives still hold regardless of whether it's pooled or not. Um, and so basically that kind of, the kind of idea is that if, if markets have these things called outstanding shares, and so at the end of a market, most people have probably sold their shares and exchanged them and, and got out of the market long before it's reported on. But there may be a few percent of people who still have the, their outstanding shares held. So the idea is that if at any point um, the value of the outstanding shares is worth more than the market cap of reputation, then it becomes like economically viable to do an attack on, this, on the network. Um, the nice property, though, is that the network can fork um, which means that it can split in two sets of reputation. And the idea is that the market you know, outside of Augur, so ignoring Augur markets, would value the set of reputation that actually reflects the reality. So if one set says um, Obama won in 2012 and one set says McCain won, um, you only require a tiny bit of the efficient market hypothesis for the market to value the set that says Obama won higher. Um, and so I think that like while pooling is a concern, um, it's, it's more about the economic incentives rather than the exact like number of reporters. But so let's say now I, you know, I'm speculating different uh, assets, right? Uh, different cryptocurrencies, etc. A lot of people you know, do that. You know, some, some may buy, some maybe bought a uh, rep, right? Uh, and they, I mean, you, you know, you were talking about a few hours every, every few months, a few hours is a few hours, right? So uh, I, I think, most people would not want to do that, right? So, and, and if you look at something like Bitcoin, a lot of people hold their coins on exchanges and in hosted wallets, etc. And the reason there is really kind of a very minor uh, gain in convenience uh, and, and to take into account, uh, you know, significant loss in security. And here, it seems like the incentive is much bigger because a few hours of work, you know, let's say someone's time is worth $30, right? That might be three hours of work even every two months, right? That might be $100, $50 a month, right? It might be $600 a year that one would essentially uh, be, be spending in time. Whereas I, if I can put it in, in uh, some hosted service that just does it for me, I, don't you think it's inevitable that the vast majority of people are going to do that? Yeah, I think I think long term people probably will do that, but it, it's it's like not something that it's not something that I'm super worried about because the the incentives still hold regardless of whether there's pooling, and there's always the final backstop of you know forking the network. Um, so so it's it's not something that I'm like super worried about. I guess is what I'd say. Okay, because then the other thing that maybe is, is worth diving into a little bit about, right? So if you don't vote, you're going to get some punishment. Is that correct? Right. So, so the, way, the way it works is there's, like, there's two types of rep. There's you know, dormant rep, which is where you don't get any trading fees, um, and you basically can't use it to report. It's basically meant so 
if you wanted to trade it, you'd switch it to dormant and then trade it and then switch it back to active. The other type of rep is active where you get trading fees, you have to report. Um, so if you have your rep active and you're you know, claiming fees and you don't report, uh, you're going to lose part of your reputation. And then you also have, if I remember correctly, you know, with the, the shelling coin idea, the point is also that if, if you're too far out from, uh, if you're an outlier, right, if you don't kind of aggregate around the consensus, you also get punished, correct? That's right. So if there's a market on, you know, um, how many inches of rain will fall somewhere and the median answer is 12.5 and you say 23, um, you're going to lose rep for, for doing that. Today's magic word is reputation. R-E-P-U-T-A-T-I-O-N. Head over to letstockbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. So you mentioned uh, with the rain thing, you, you're an outlier, the consensus is 23, uh, you, you voted 12, uh, and, and now you get some punishment. Now, my concern here too is, so let's say you have some pooling going on, some people put these funds in there, now, and all of a sudden, 30, 40% of, of the reps are held by that. I mean, then their predictions really start to set uh, that shelling point and they start to become that shelling point. So, I mean, I think number one is, right, if I want to vote on my own, it becomes more risky. The more people put their money into the service that kind of votes together. Um, and and so, so I think that's, that's one thing that actually makes it less attractive to do that. And then the other concern, I guess, would be once they have, yeah, 40%, 50% or something, couldn't they just, you know, dictate the, the events and then what, what makes it that those, uh, that those reports would actually be the true, the true value and not some other thing? Uh, so there's a few things. So you don't actually know how the pool is going to report ahead of time because it's a commit and reveal. Um, but there's still the valid point of, I might, may, should I join the pool just so that you know, I'll always be reporting with them anyway? Um, and, the, and the answer to that is, I, I think, you know, it's one of those things, 99% of the time it will be risk, less risky. But the issue is, what if the pool messes up? Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, playing, um, playing Russian roulette with, with a, lot of, a lot of empty barrels in the chamber. And once in a while, the pool may screw up. Someone may attack the pool and reports wrongly, or the pool operator may just do something malicious. And the problem is, once that happens, then the backstops kick in, and, and those would kind of screw the people in the pool over. Um, and the reason is, the, the first backstop is everyone reports on everything. The penalties go up for that. Um, and say the pool has 60%, so even that doesn't work. And the network forks um, <clears throat> into two sets of reputation. And in this one, it's, it's really not the reporters deciding things so much as much as the traders who are trading reputation. Um, and the reason is because the traders should value the set that represents reality higher. And it's something that's like, it's like it does rely on a bit on efficient markets, but it's like if markets are so inefficient that they can't choose something that clearly reflects reality, then maybe prediction markets aren't such a good idea in the first place. Uh, so it's something we're comfortable relying on. But, but so in this case, uh, let's say now 60% are in this pool and, and they vote uh, the wrong result. I mean, a fork, because 60% of the funds are in there, it also means that the private keys for 60% of the tokens are in there. So how did that fork, how would that actually happen? You, you wouldn't actually be able to fork then, no? Uh, so the, the way a fork works on Augur is actually, you just basically post a bond of like 1% of rep. So you do need like 1% of people to basically either pool their money together or you know if there's some whale that has a bunch, then the whale could do it. Um, and it can only be done after the second backstop of reporting on everything uh, or everyone reporting on something. And so if someone posts the bond to fork, what happens is um, <clears throat> the people who, you know, the pool of 60% or whatever is going to lose like around 40% of their rep in the fork. Um, the person who posts the bond is going to lose their rep in the original branch um, and they're going to get double back in the fork. So then instead of theirs, you know, for someone to 
do the fork so that they basically make money. And, and so it doesn't matter if they own 60% of rep because they're going to lose a lot of it in the fork. Um, and the other thing is you don't need, it's, it's not like, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum where you need a, uh, actually, I guess even in Bitcoin and Ethereum, you don't need a majority to fork. The thing is people will just ignore you if you fork and it's a bad fork. It's like, say I wanted to fork Ethereum and it was just over some random thing. Say I lost my private key and I wanted to get my money back and I fork it. Um, people will just ignore it. Um, but with something like this, you know, if I forked the Augur network and it's because the network said that uh, Trump won even though he didn't, then there's, an, there's quite a bit of incentive for people to actually follow my fork as opposed to just ignoring it. If I have that choice, right? But if my money is lying in the pool, I might actually not be able to access it at that point. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the big danger of, of using a pool. Is that's what I meant when I said it's, you know, it's, it's less risky 99.99% of the time, right? But it's the one, you know, the one bullet in the chamber that you might accidentally get shot with uh, if, if the pool messes up. Um, so yeah, you would, the, the way a fork works is you get, you have two sets of reputations. So you have one set, you know, in the pool and your other set, you'd get it on the fork, except you would have like less rep because you were on the side that, you know, committed to the pre-fork, pre-fork report, but. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly right that, uh, that there would be, I mean, in, in a way, the risk of putting your rep into a pool is kind of comparable to the risk of leaving your coins in an exchange, right? Like, goes well, 99%, and yeah, sure, there may be a risk. But yeah, I guess my concern is just that in this case, it seems like the incentives are so strong to do that, much stronger than with Bitcoin. That At least that concerns me a little. But... Anyway, uh, Sebastian, you had a question. Yeah, so let's uh, let's talk about the the user experience side. So, can you tell us uh, how you know what 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 is a, a typical guy like me who wants to use the prediction market like Augur have to do to use it? Basically, so the the way it kind of works is we're making the UI basically a web interface. Um, so you'd go to a website and it downloads all the code uh, basically to your browser, and it's all run client side from there. Um, if you had an Ethereum node running in the background, it would use that. Otherwise, it would ping, I think it uses EtherCamp's hosted nodes. So what it does is it, all your transactions are signed in the browser and they're submitted to the network. So if you wanted to trade on something, you would, you know, there's two things you could do. One is you could search for a market. So if you have a real specific idea of what you want to trade on, say you're looking to trade on a presidential election market, you might search presidential elections or 2016 US elections, something like that. If you're just kind of browsing around, um, there's a category system where you can basically kind of filter by different tags that people can choose for their markets. And then there's also filters by volume and fees. So as a trader, you're going to want to search for like lowest fees, highest volume markets, because that's where you're going to be able to trade the most to get the best prices. Um, and what you would do is you click on the market you like, and there'll be, you know, multiple outcomes. If it's a binary market, just two outcomes. Um, and you can, you know, buy yes, that it will happen or buy that you think it's not going to happen. And there's an order book and you can input how many shares you want to buy, um, the max amount you're willing to spend. Um, so basically, it's just limit orders. Um, market orders for something like Augur aren't really a super good idea because like, while you can pick up orders on the book, um, it can be very dangerous in, in like early days when there's not a lot of liquidity. You know, If I place a market order on the New York Stock Exchange, that's fine. If I place it on Augur, I could be buying it at 99 cents a share if I'm not careful. Uh, so it uses limit orders by default. You'll click buy, um, it'll commit your trade, um, and then it will reveal it a block later. It does that to prevent front running, so a miner can't just sit there and front run all the trades. Um, and then you'll have your shares. And then so you can do two things. You can you know hold them, or you can sell them to another person. Or there's a third thing you can do, which is kind of weird that I don't think most people will do, um, maybe like the professionals will, which is you can buy the other outcome and then exchange it for a complete set. Um, and the reason is, in a binary market, you have two outcomes, yes and no. The combined, they're worth one. So if you own the yes and you buy the no, then you can exchange them for a complete set and get one back and exit immediately. Or you can just sell your no or sell your yes to someone else. Okay, that, that's interesting. Uh, so either you, either you hold it. I mean, so there's three outcomes. So either you hold your coins, either you can sell uh, your shares. You can sell those shares to someone else. Uh, or you can just you get you could buy the whole um, the whole outcome, 
and have that as the basis for to basically bet on another prediction is yeah it's kind of like that so it's like say we had keep it simple say we have um presidential election market and the two outcomes are hillary and trump and say you're long hillary so you bought hillary at 60 cents a share and she goes up to 80 uh say trump's been saying some really stupid stuff she goes up to 80 percent and you want to sell um so you can just sell it to someone else um the other thing you can do is you can buy Trump for 20 and then sell the complete set. Um, and, and the reason is because the reason the complete sets exist at all is if you think about traditional financial markets like, like the New York Stock Exchange, Apple shares already exist. They may issue more at some point in the future. They may buy some back. Um, they're probably not going to go bankrupt or get acquired. Um, so the shares are already there. But with prediction markets, the shares don't exist. If you make a new market on Augur on the presidential election, the shares kind of have to be created. And the way they're created is with this complete sets thing. So if I'm a market creator or a market maker and I want to provide some liquidity to a market, I may spend $500, buy 500 complete sets, and then offer them on the order book for people to buy. Let's take a short break and talk about Hi.me. Hi.me is a VPN provider. And if you don't know yet why you should need a VPN provider, let us help you. I'm sure you were like me, and when all the crazy revelations came out during the Snowden time uh, of all the, the spying that is being done by the NSA and other government agencies, you were shocked, and you said, not with me, not with my own rights. Now, the way government agencies can spy on you, there's many of them, but the most easiest way is by simply going to your ISP and getting all your traffic, capturing all your traffic. And the VPN can protect you from that. It can give you a secure tunnel from your computer to any of the exit nodes all over the world so that all your traffic goes to this secure pipe that's encrypted and cannot be intruded on. And with Hike.me, you can choose any of their, their 30 exit nodes all over the world so you can enter the internet in a secure location. The best thing about Hide.me is that they have a free plan, which includes two gigabytes of unthrottled bandwidth per month. So you can go to Hide.me slash Epicenter to create your free account. And when you use that URL, you'll automatically get 35% off if ever you decide to go premium. Now the premium plans are really great. They include unlimited bandwidth, access to all of the 30 exit nodes that Hide.me provides, and you can install it on up to five devices at a time. So you can have this running on your phone, your tablet, your computer at work, your personal computer, and just be completely protected all the time. And of course, Hide.me accepts Bitcoin. So we'd like to thank Hide.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Now, I'd like to come back to the, to, to the software. Um, so you mentioned that it's a, a web app. Um, this means that I can run uh, the Augur client locally and I can connect it to my own ether node and I can connect it to the contract and make those commits myself and fund uh, the contract myself um, basically from, from my own machine, right? Right. Okay. Uh, so then this brings me to the, the next question is then what is the business model for Augur? Where, uh, where do you guys fit in all this? So, you know, like, Basically, we're just we're the reporters in the system. So um, when we did the rep distribution, sixteen percent of it's distributed amongst like around twenty people, founders and advisors and employees, and four percent is held by the foundation, which is used for things like we've given some to people in the community who have done cool stuff. Um, like someone made it like a, few, a bunch of auger shirts. We gave them a little bit of rep, um, things like that. We'll probably give away some of that in like bug bounties, um, and so that that's kind of you know. Right now, um, we're mostly focused on building the protocol and, and the platform and getting it out there. And then later on, we'd be focused on building more like possibly like for-profit ventures around it. Um, there's some like really cool things you can do with that. Like if you think of the UI we have right now, it's not super easy to use because you have to do lots of stuff to make it be 100% decentralized. Um, so like we can't store the user's private keys. So that means you can't have something like blockchain.info um, or... Um, we can't store it really a cache of the data, so we have to rely on the community to do it. Um, so that makes it kind of slow. So there's lots of things like that that you know, for profit could potentially build like a UI around it that's easier to use. And maybe you could do something really cool, like some one idea I've been playing around with is the idea of um, having like ads in the UI, but giving part of the revenue from them to the people who trade or trade in the UI to subsidize their trades. So like if you use that UI, you basically have lower trading fees 
Um, that's kind of cool stuff that you can do with crypto that isn't really feasible with like, you know, say PayPal or something. Okay, uh, I, I understand that. Um, now, uh, I wanted to talk also about security. So uh, this is something that has sort of come up since the DAO attack, and especially around Ethereum, and uh, you know the uh, you know the the validity of these soft, of these contracts uh, written in Solidity. Uh, have you taken anything away from that? Uh, what have you learned uh, from the DAO hack and what are the what are the, some of the things that Augur is doing differently from that project to ensure that this type of thing wouldn't happen uh, in uh, in the DAO in the uh, Augur smart contract? Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, I paid attention pretty closely to the to the DAO once it got attacked. I didn't really follow it too closely until then. Um, and so <laughs> um, there's quite a few things. So if you look at, you know, the, the types of vulnerabilities that, that occurred in the DAO, yeah, like the call dot value issues where you're just kind of sending gas to a contract that may or may not be trusted. In the case of the attacker's contract, it was definitely not to be trusted. Um, and so there's lots of things we're doing to kind of mitigate that. Um, we try to use send wherever possible as opposed to, as opposed to call dot value because send only sends a minimal amount of gas. Um, and then all the Augur contracts themselves, some of the stuff has already always been planned. Like we want to have white lists on them so that um, we can basically trust the Augur contracts to communicate with each other, um, but it doesn't mean we can trust others. Um, just things like mutexes, which is the idea where you um, make it so your contract can't be recursively called. So if you look at the DAO, what happened was um, basically they just kept recalling the split DAO function over and over again. Um, so you can prevent that with a thing called mutexes, where you basically just check if a function's been called more than once, and if it has, you don't let it proceed. Um, and then some of the other stuff we've been doing is I've been reading all the like NASA and JPL programming guidelines, uh, the MISR ones from the automobile industry, and then I've been implementing them all in our code base. So there's lots of stuff you can do to make it so your code base is more simple and easier to follow. Um, and there's basically we've been implementing all those security guidelines in our code base to you know give it as best a chance as possible as it can have. Um, and then. Another thing we'll be doing is, is lots of bug bounties. Um, I think if the DAO had bounties, it, maybe if you have like a $10,000 bounty, it, I, I think there's a decent chance that the bug would have been found, or the vulnerability would have been found. Um, so I think stuff like that is key. Um, and then the final thing is making it so that you can recover from an attack or a hack without you know relying on forking Ethereum is, is a huge lesson. Um, so if something like Augur got hacked, you'd want it so that you can upgrade the contracts quickly um, and resolve it on contract, um, as, a, as opposed to, you know, hoping that Ethereum will fork around us. You mentioned, uh, bug bounties, uh, are people finding bugs in Augur and, and claiming those bug bounties? Um, so we've only, we've only started one for like the, you know, this contract that we're going to use for, for like the rep distribution. We, we started a bounty for that. I need to increase it. It's, it's like at a thousand dollars right now. I need to make it like 10,000. Um, nobody's found any bugs yet. Um, so I'll probably have a post about that soon. Um, and then uh, the, the core contracts on chain, we haven't started bug bounties for those yet because um, I'm still fixing some stuff, basically. I'm still, I'm still making a bunch of edits to them uh, to make them comply with the NASA guidelines and the, and the automobile guidelines. Um, I don't want to start the, the bounties until after that's done. And, of course, one, one should say in, uh, in you guys sort of a defense, uh, defense may be the wrong word, but I mean, so the, the crowd sale was in 2014. Now it's, it's all two years later or around two years later. And, you know, you're sort of still working on it, right? Whereas the dog guys was like, let's just go ahead, you know, raise 150 million. Uh, so I, I think they were a little bit particular in, in that regard. Um, speaking of that, What's the timeline here? When is Augur going to launch? And, and, and are there going to be different stages to that? Yeah, so, so the timeline, so we did about a year of development from 2014 to 2015. Then we did the crowd sale. It started like maybe 10 days from now, a year ago today. Um, and so now it's like a year later. Um, and yeah, we've been, we've been taking our time just you know, iterating on it. Um, as far as timeline, um, 
what we're looking to do is basically enter security audits once once I finish getting this this stuff done to make it comply with the NASA guidelines. Um, there aren't really any more features to add to the back end besides like security ones, um, which we're taking our time with. Um, so we should be able to start security audits relatively soon. We're aiming to launch a, a new version of the beta, beta of the beta in a couple of weeks um, that'll have like limit orders and uh, some of the new reporting stuff from the back end in an order book, whereas the old beta only had a market scoring rule. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're basically taking our time to try to get it as, as secure as possible, to stew bugs as possible. And then as far as like phases for the launch, um, I think the way we would do it is initially start out where like we have maybe like a multi-sig that allows us to modify the contracts very quickly. Um, so in the early days, if something goes wrong, we can push a fix. Um, later on, you know, once the system matures, then we could have people have the reporters basically vote on updates to the contracts. So that's kind of like a difference between, you know, when it would first launch and, and later on. As opposed to like f from a feature level, um, it'll have binary markets, scalar markets, and categorical markets from, from day one. Um, we removed multidimensional markets after the DAO attack because we thought they were too complicated and we decided to just avoid that. Um, and that's, that's kind of where it's at. So I wanted to come back to a topic that uh, maybe we should have uh, discussed earlier, but uh, I guess that this is a good time to talk about. It. So the ethical aspects of uh, prediction markets and uh, we have been criticized. Uh, I mean, just generally prediction markets have been criticized for this is that the, you know, the ability to have predictions on things like deaths, on things like assassinations, on things like terrorist attacks occurring uh, or not occurring. You know, with something like a decentralized prediction market, of course, it makes it a lot harder to uh, regulate whether or not those predictions can make it onto the market or not. Uh, what, what is your stance on that? Like, do you think that there should be norms around those kind of things, or should we just let uh, people make predictions about whatever the hell they want? I think there should be norms. Uh, so there's like there's like two answers to this question. Um, one's a, a cop out, but a practical answer, and one is um, like how it actually works on Augur. So on Augur, um, reporters basically can judge whether a market is unethical or not. Um, so when you report, you can also submit whether you think a market's unethical. Um, I suspect that you know only like very egregious things would get reported as unethical. So things like assassination markets or, or markets that would cause harm to other people. Like if someone made a market to incentivize um, robbing a bank or killing someone or something, um, I'd hope that the reporters would report that as unethical. Um, I, I certainly would. Um, but from a practical standpoint, I think the concerns are a bit overblown because in traditional financial markets today, these incentives are all at play and nothing really happens. So if you look at, um, so a good example of this is, take any Fortune 500 company. You can buy options that expire within a few days. If you were to assassinate the CEO and buy put options, you know, the day before, you can make way more money than you could probably make on Augur doing something similar. But there's, it doesn't happen. Um, and so th these kind of incentives already exist in the real world. And, you know, it's, it's a nice, uh, I guess it's a, it's a nice thing to make you have uh, faith in humanity, I guess, that they don't actually happen. Um, hmm. And so th there's like, there's also like the idea is like, you could also make way better ways to incentivize this sort of stuff on Ethereum, which is kind of another cop-out answer. You know, prediction markets are not the best way to do this. Um, if you did want to kill someone, you could use a, a dominant insurance contract where all the money goes to the person who actually kills them. On a prediction market, people can buy the other side, um, which means that you're not actually doing it in the most, you know, economically efficient way because you're giving a lot of money pe to people who didn't actually do the job. Um, that's like a very cop-out answer, but uh, it's it's... You know, it's definitely true. Yeah, actually, so I I, I was watching this panel, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and your co-founder, uh, Jack Peterson, mentioned that you could have a vote on whether or not uh, a question was, uh, a prediction was ethical or not. I mean, the, then then you're kind of, you mentioned earlier that you, you rep, um, reporters will, will set the bar and, and define whether a question is ethical or not. Um, uh, then, then the question becomes, you know, 
where do you set that bar? Uh, they, you know, that bar may differ from person to person or from culture to culture. If you could have a way to have votes on whether or not questions were ethical, uh, then you're essentially, you know, uh, layering on like, you know, the prediction on top of the prediction uh, and perhaps getting a better representation of whether or not a question was ethical. I mean, I think this would only really be useful at like large scales, as you mentioned. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to make money there's, a, there's better ways that you can make money uh, than to go assassinate someone and make a prediction about it on the prediction market. But um, on some, like, you know, at the edges, there may be other uh, perhaps not so, uh, you know, predictions that wouldn't be so grave, but uh, could potentially be considered unethical in certain places uh, where you might want to get um, uh, some sort of wisdom of the crowds around the ethical aspects of that prediction. Yeah, I think with like with Augur, since the since the reporting system is, is kind of so global um, and distributed, you know, at least now ignoring the pool problem, um, you you kind of really get a global set of norms. It's so like the things that people consider unethical are probably going to be only things that are kind of globally considered unethical. Uh, so things like like most cultures will consider you know assassinating someone to be unethical. Um, most consider stealing from someone to be unethical. Um, but then there's other like waste waste you know way less grave things that that might not be considered unethical but might pe make people uneasy. I can't think of any off the top of my head. I guess maybe maybe like a geopolitical market. You know something like the CIA would love to have like mm. um, will Russia invade Estonia within the next five years? I don't I don't think that would get reported as unethical in Augur. Um, that that's like a good example of one that's kind of gray, but but to the Estonians uh, would you know the Estonians would probably consider that to be unethical. They'd probably I don't know they, they're a pretty pretty technologically advanced country. I bet I bet they'd want a market like that so they could have better odds, you know, be better better probability of knowing what's what's coming or not. Yeah, and of course here the the kind of danger would only be well if Russia says we're really low on money. We need to have, make money some way. Oh, there's this big prediction market on us invading Estonia. Let's bet they're invaded and take that pot, which is, of course, an absurd scenario, right? So that's not going to happen. So <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's yeah. pretty absurd. And it's also like it's also like relies on the fact that, you know, people in the Russian government want to insider trade and front run those trades, which, which you know would, would happen, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Now, one last topic we do have and we want to talk about, it, and it's it's also a topic that we kind of revisit very, very regularly, and that's the, the kind of topic of governance. And again, our listeners probably will not need much of an introduction to that, but the best uh, example, I think, of governance that isn't really working so well is Bitcoin, right, where there's a lot of division and no agreement on how to evolve the protocol and, and no way to... Uh, to, to come to an agreement here. Now, presumably, Augur is also going to need to evolve and to up, uh, be upgraded, etc. So is there is there going to be a process for that? How will these decisions get made? Yeah, so right now, it's, it's a very simple governance metric. It's basically just reporters can vote on upgrades to the contracts. Uh, so the way it kind of works is there's a registry contract which maintains the latest version of you know, each of the contracts. And um, reporters can vote on whether to update them or not. Um, <clears throat> you know, longer term, you have more interesting things like futurarchy and, and things like that. Um, but it, for the early days of the system, we're kind of trying to keep it simple, um, as opposed to you know going with something that's probably better in theory, but but much more complicated, I guess. So you guys would uh, propose uh, a new contract, and then the reporters would essentially vote on, you know, do they want to improve that or not? Yeah. Yep. Basically, um, or you know, if, if I propose a contract and everyone hates it, some random person from the community can propose another contract that you know modifies two lines and th the reporters like better or something. Okay. Great. Well, Joey, with that, I think we're at the, at the end of our episode. Thanks so much for coming on. I think it was really interesting to to dive into Augur to hear a little bit about how you, you guys are approaching things. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
And, uh, and of course, we are very much looking forward to, you know, seeing it in action. We were playing around a little bit with the beta before, so that's possible to do, of course. So we will have links to the Argo website, uh, to the application, the beta application, where you can play around with, with test coins and, and to some other resources if people want to learn more about Augur. And of course, we'll also link to, to some of our previous episodes on prediction markets if people want to dive more into that. So thanks so much for coming on and thanks so much to our listeners for listening. So we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and, and lots of other shows on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. So we put these episodes out every Monday. You can subscribe to the show on your favorite listening app, whether that's on mobile or SoundCloud or whether you'd like to watch uh, the videos on, on youtube.com slash episode of Bitcoin. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.